and see if this advice is biblical or not. This is a Bible study, right? Yeah. This is a Sabbath school class. So when we have a question, what do we do? Start throwing out a bunch of opinions, or do we go to Scripture, if you believe the Scripture is inspired? Amen. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing what? Salvation. Salvation. Now, let's get into it. Teaching us that what? Huh? That denying ungodliness and worldly what? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly where? When we get to heaven, because that's certainly not possible on planet Earth. Is that what it says? Well, that's what's being taught in the Christian world today. Is there a problem here? Yes. See, if Job doesn't rely on God having made himself relevant to Job, Job is about to head what? In the wrong direction. With his well-meaning, sincere friends. Folks, sincerity and well-being has nothing to do with Christian living. That is, if you believe that the Bible is inspired. Well, but I would also apply that to our intent to be righteous. You know, I, I've lived last generation theology, perfection doctrine for years and years. And it didn't produce what it promised. You know, it sounds good, but in practice it's not real. Right? No, it's the mercy of God only. And if I'm transformed, it's it's like Abraham. You know, the sincerity of moral flesh produces Ishmael's. You know, it's why Cain killed Abel because he was angry that his fruit wasn't accepted by God. But the reality is, is that Isaac came from a dead womb. It didn't come from Abraham. Can we all identify with what Jesus yeah. shared with us? Thank you. Thank you. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, who? Jesus Christ. For what? Gave himself for what? All of our iniquities. What is God doing here? He's trying to make himself relevant to us. Of what he has taken the initiative to do. And how he did it through Christ. Uh, about Romans 5, 1 through 5. What are we exploring right now? Whether Eliphaz's advice to... Job is, look, quit trying to be good. It's impossible. You're wasting your time to establish a relationship with a perfect God while on this earth. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith unto his, into his grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Does it sound like it is possible to establish a relationship with God on planet Earth before Jesus comes back? So, this is a different version of the Gospel than what you have shared with us, you have heard, and that I experienced in my own life. Is this good news or good advice? <laughs> this is good news. And again, why is that, what is that all about? God trying to make Himself what? relevant to us before he asks us to become relevant to him. Now, let's go to Job 4 again. Let's take a look at verses 19 to 21. 
How much more are those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth? Verse 20, between morning and evening they are broken in pieces, unobserved, they perish forever. Is not their tent cord plucked up within them? They die, yet without wisdom. In other words, we wake up every morning just like a moth wakes up and starts flying around and we go about our business, but at the end of the day, what happened? Boom, boom. We're stumped to death and we become dust. And that's what other guys are saying. You're going to end up like a moth. Is that good advice? Is it biblical? Who would like to turn to Proverbs chapter 1? Chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Find out if this advice by Eliphaz is biblical or not. Proverbs chapter 3. Who would like to read verses verse 1? Proverbs chapter 3 verse 1. My son, do not forget my law, but let me keep my commands. Thank you. My son, forget not my law, but let your what? Heart. The word keep means cherish, guard, protect, appreciate. I know in English the word keep suggests us doing something. But in the original language of Hebrew and Greek it means to guard, cherish, protect, appreciate. I am going to say something very important to you. I'm going to give you something very important. Cherish my what? My promises to you. That's what it means to keep my law in your heart. How about verses 5 and 6? Same chapter. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. So apparently there's a contradiction between what we're, between what we're reading and the advice that Eliphaz is giving who? Job. How about verse 9? Of, uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs uh, 9, uh, verse 10. Proverbs 9, verse 10. Because Eliphaz is telling Job to forget about it, gaining understanding and wisdom. What do we learn from Proverbs 9, verse 10? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is his understanding. The word fear means a reverence for God is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Which Eliphaz is saying to Job, forget it, not on this earth. Now, let's take a look at Job chapter 4, verse 7. We're going back a little bit here. Remember now, Job, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright destroyed? The reason you're going through this, Job, is because you have messed up somewhere in your past. And God has come to what? He's going to punish you. And you're going to suffer. So accept it. Does everyone turn to Isaiah 53, verses 4, 5, and 6 and see if this advice is scriptural or not? Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4, 5, and 6. Because a lot of people, a lot of churches still teach that if you're experiencing a bad time, it's because you have been bad. And God is going to... Bring you the consequences. Isaiah 53, beginning with this, verse 4. Surely our griefs he, uppercase H means Christ, himself, uppercase, bore. Our griefs he bore. And our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. Verse 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. 
Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So folks, if you believe scripture, then you have to believe that all of the evil before Christ, at Christ's time, and unto the end of time, all of the evil has been paid for already. Amen. So whatever it is that happens to us has nothing to do with what God is trying to do in us. Do we have difficult times? Yes. Physically, mentally, emotionally? Yes. But most of the time it's a result of the choices that we have made. There are exceptions, and that is when some, when God sees fit for me to go through a Job experience, what is He going to do there? God is bringing me to the graduate level of Christian living, which those who will be alive when Jesus comes must experience. Is that a privilege? Is that a blessing? And if we don't understand it that way, we will never understand what was accomplished at the cross. What is the purpose of Job's and our sufferings today? The gospel aspect of suffering. What is the purpose of it? Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. So what's the problem? We've decided that 
God has not given us enough detail in the things that we are curious about. Really? And so we get into what? Speculation and interpretation of the Scripture. The last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22, 18, and 19, is very clear. Anyone that takes away or adds to the Word of God, God will take away or add to His consequences. Over here. Can you read uh, Job 42, 7? Job 42, 7? Job 42. Well, that's not part of our lesson, but go ahead and read it. Okay. And it was so... That after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the chief Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee, and against thy two friends, for they have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job. Let me away the story. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it further makes his point, though. <laughs> They eventually get it, don't they? Yeah. Okay, what are we exploring? When I study the Bible, I study it for selfish reasons. My definition of selfishness is that I want to get something out from me. That's my definition of selfishness. Now, let's take a look at Colossians 1.18. Is there a reward in suffering? Yes. Or being tested by God? Yes. Or in the process by which God makes Himself relevant to us before He asks us to become relevant for, to him, for him? Colossians 1.18 Are we ready? He is also head of the body. The body is the church. And He is the beginning, the firstborn, from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. So here we see why God permits what? <coughs> Suffering, testing, because he wants to become relevant to us so that we will become, he will become what? First. Make him first in our life. Making us relevant for him. Now that's a very interesting expression there. The firstborn. Remember John 1.14? Yeah. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and? Sure. Now, what does that mean to me today? Let's turn to Romans chapter 8 verse 29. Romans 8 29. We're applying Job to us today. And determining if all of the unsolicited advice he's getting has any merit. <laughs> which is a glaring sign to each one of us that whenever we hear someone say something, whether up here from Sabbath school class or up there, any church you go to, what should we do? Exactly what the Apostle Paul tells us to do in Acts 17, verse 11. He commended the Bereans as being the noblest of all the Christians. Why? Because they respectfully listened to what the speaker was saying, whether it was Sabbath school teacher or the preacher, and what did they do when they got home? They scrutinized everything that they had heard to see if it was wrong. Valid. Romans 8, 29. Follow this very carefully. For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. <laughs> so Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. <laughs> but what is the expression that we just read in Colossians 1.18? And here. The firstborn from the what? Do you know what the word firstborn, how it's spelled in Greek? P-R-O-T-O-T-O-K-O-S. Prototokos, where we get the word prototype. So what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is what? The prototype. And you and I are what? If he's the firstborn from the dead, who are you and I? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
Isn't that awesome? That's what Paul is saying here in Romans 8, 29. After the cross, Jesus is never spoken of as the firstborn. He's always spoken of as the first what? Son. Firstborn from the dead. Forgive me. Before the cross, Jesus is spoken of as the only begotten. After the cross, he's spoken of as the firstborn from the dead. He is a prototype. And you may choose to be what? Two, three, four, five, six. Do you like that? Yeah. I just read it to you from Scripture. We're talking grammar here. I'm not interpreting anything. <laughs> That's what the word prototype means. Is that awesome or not? Amen. Amen. Can you get excited about sharing that with someone? Yes. That if they choose to be first, what? Second born from the dead, what are they experiencing? Peace, what are the three blessings of justification by faith? Peace with God, the strength of God, and the glory of God. So, that is the length that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have gone to to make themselves relevant to us before they ask us to become relevant for them. Okay. I, ha I heard the first bell, so... Um, the word curse is a very important word. But as our title suggests, last week was what? Curse my birthday. This week is curse, curse is causeless. The curse causeless. What does that mean? Well, if God is trying to make himself relevant to me so that I will be willing to become relevant for him, then everything that he allows to happen in my life to bring me up to that level that those that will be alive in Jesus comes from this experience, how could that curse become a reality when God is the one that's orchestrating all this? Does that make any sense? Everything that is happening here to Job, once Job understands it, should be the most incredible honor and privilege that any human being can go through. If we understand why Job went through what he went through. Does that make sense or not? That's the purpose of our study, as I understand it, from Scripture this week. The question that we must ask ourselves is simply this. And it's a personal question. Has God made himself relevant to you? And until you can say yes to that, there is no reason in the world for you to allow God to make you relevant for him. <coughs> Because you will be living a miserable life. Until God has proved to you, convinced you, that He has done everything that He possibly can to become relevant to you. Any questions? Do you think that Joe was a type of Christ? You know that Joseph was a type of Christ. And David could be considered Christ. Do you think Job could be considered a type of Christ? Yes. Do you think that Job had to understand the difference between what we've been talking about as in having faith in Jesus compared to the faith of Jesus? Do you think well, Job had to understand that last part? So far through the first six lessons, that has not happened. But as we know, well, I don't know what I should <laughs> Please do. It I don't wanna, this is a very positive lesson for me. Hmm. To me, it is such an incredible honor and privilege. Once we understand what's happening here, that it is God, since Adam and Eve chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, it is God that is trying to convince us that He is reliable. Hmm. 
He's trying to make himself relevant to us before he asks us to become relevant for him. But there's a constant warfare, isn't there? Yes. Satan is not going to give up. But our focus should not be on Satan. Some people are focused on Islam. Some people are focused on what the Pope says, or you know, if he's had a bad day and what he might do. Folks, has Jesus conquered sin? Yes. Has Jesus conquered temptation? Yes. When is Jesus coming back? <laughs> when he finds a people that have chosen to become what? God. Relevant for him. He would orchestrate the whole thing. That's the only issue. I'm not trying to oversimplify, but uh, let me read very, very quickly. It's just, well, let's go to Scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18, the last verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Our being, as we appreciate and accept that God has convinced us that He has become relevant to us, then we will be willing to what? Let Him reproduce His glory in us. And in so doing, we become relevant for God. Let's have prayer. Loving Father, we thank You for the privilege of studying Your Word, especially Job's experience. We thank You that He never cursed You. And we pray that we will never allow ourselves to forget that you have gone through everything that Satan could possibly throw at Jesus. And that, that his victory is our victory by faith. Once we understand the purpose of life, which is to make ourselves relevant for you, so that that reality can be witnessed to the world and Jesus can come back again. We thank you and pray that that will be our experience because we ask these requests in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.